All right, it's that time of business where we talk about business in the 8 o'clock hour. And of course, the big question is, how will Islamic banking operate in Uganda? It's something that we've been doing stories on, covering it in parliament with the finance committee sittings and the interactions that have been back and forth in adoption of Islamic banking here in Uganda. My name is Priscilla Regina Naluga. Welcome to our business update. Now, regarding Islamic banking, it recently attracted media attention and generated animated commentary from the public in line with its constitutional mandate bank of uganda working with parliament to ensure that legislation enabling the introduction of islamic banking products in uganda was enacted consequently the financial institutions act 2004 was amended in 2016 and the amendments included specific provisions allowing for the establishment of fully fledged islamic financial institutions and for existing financial institutions to offer Islamic banking alongside their conversation or conventional banking services. But what is Islamic banking in the first place? Well, we do have Jackson Onyango who could give us a better perspective to this conversation. Consultative meeting by the Finance Committee on the six tax amendments before it was the last one in the process of scrutinization. It has been five working days since the committee was tasked with the responsibility but they are required to have a report ready to be presented to plenary on Tuesday, something they feel strongly about. So it becomes a little bit tricky, Honorable Chair, with all due respect, that within one week, and in this week, we have two days off, that is Saturday and Sunday. Today is a Monday, we are here, tomorrow is a Tuesday, we have to present these bills on the floor of Parliament at two. Without having stakeholders engagement, understanding the deep analysis about the bill. Government is seeking to operationalize Islamic banking with enactment of amendments into the stamp duty, value added tax, income duty, excise duty, financial institutions, and foreign exchange acts. The target by the government is to have Islamic banking commence with the next financial year just four days away. The economy needs refinancing with reasonable finance uh, costs you know, the cost, money cost. And most of the business and players in the private sector are looking at Islamic financing as another source that will help them to revamp. Legal tax consultant Sefas Virunji called for more time for comprehensive consultations. Virunji argued that the singular independent amendments into the existing laws risk causing confusion in the economy. Islamic succession regime could, have a separ could be separate from VAT to income tax to stamp duty, all these, once you are reading them by just amending provisions of the law, you are creating a confusion. And remember, within that regime, you are not saying this part applies to Islamic banking, this doesn't apply to it. Virunji pointed out that Uganda Revenue Authority will face an uphill task in executing its responsibility in this case. The staff of URA themselves have not been trained on this in Sharia law and Sharia law taxation, the, the, the players like us who practice tax have not had time on this. So when you say this begi begins, say, July 1, how are we going to, to do that? The team from the finance ministry told the committee that the amendments to the tax measures were between Islamic banking and conventional banking. The MPs argued that the notion is simplistic. Jackson Onyango. And TV. Well, thank you so much, Jackson Onyango, for giving us a sneak peek into the Islamic banking. Now, of course, we do have experts on the matter that we have brought here in Morning at NTV to give us a better perspective, understanding, and uh, erase all those uh, eyebrows that have been rising left, right, and center, especially in consideration of denomination or banking. Dr. Sulaiman Luja, a manager of Islamic investments at the Microfinance Support Center Limited, joins us this morning. Good morning to you, Doctor. Uh, Morning. And most welcome. Thank you. We also have uh, Mr. Abu Bekar Mayanja. He's an economist. And from the economic side of uh, view, uh, point of view, uh, religion and some of these things that are happening sectarian wise, uh, where do we draw the lines? Good morning to you, Mr. Mayanja. Good morning. Mm. <laughs> Actually, uh, Islamic finance started in the, in the 70s in Saudi Arabia. It, 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 it's, 
you know, origins come from the fact that, you know, there's an alternative system of finance that doesn't charge money on money, which is interest. And it's supposed to take an interest in the actual business uh, that somebody's doing either a trade or an investment. And then the financial institution shares profits with uh, the entrepreneur. And so it is trade related and equity related. Uh, quite important in a market where there could be stress due to debt ratios, uh, debt equity ratios of companies. So it is an alternative form of finance. Of course, the Bank of Uganda has an obligation to broaden and deepen the financial system. Broadening is about creating a variety of products that fit different members of society can choose. It's the same way people choose different clothes in the morning mm -hmm. or different types of food. So the, the, the name Islamic finance simply means that it's a, it doesn't include interest. The banks will be sharing profits with the people that borrow. Okay. That's it in, in brief. Dr. Ruja, in regards to what has been happening in the floor of parliament, the bill on Islamic banking, the argument is that there's already provision of some of these requests in already existing bills and laws. So what are the tallies in regards to what they claim is already existent in the present laws? You see, uh, the subject of Islamic banking is uh, known world over. Even in Uganda, this discussion started way back in 2008. Can you imagine? Bank of Uganda uh, undertook a, a study to see the perception of people and the readiness of the market to this global trend. Then uh, uh, financial institutions also started preparing themselves. By the way, these financial institutions, most of them, they are international. Where they are coming from, they are doing it already, like KCB like uh, ABSA, uh, like uh, Standard Chartered. Uh, St Stambik, Standard Bank is uh, the biggest in, in, in South Africa. So for them, they are ready. Then the laws were passed in 2016. That is the Financial Institutions Amendment Act, which brought on board Islamic banking. Mm -hmm. 2016, Bank of Uganda started on the regulations, the enabling regulations to start Islamic banking in Uganda. That is when the discussions of tax, maybe some people are hearing it for the first time now, mm -hmm. when it has appeared in the, in the session of committee of the parliament. But that discussion started way back in 2016. Mm -hmm. So Bank of Uganda prepared, and even Uganda Revenue Authority prepared for it. They know what to do, and they have been doing it. I can tell you that there is a selected committee in the Ministry of Finance uh, which was put from all, uh, from different relevant agencies, Uganda Revenue Authority. That was 2019, that is when we started in the Ministry of Finance, that, that committee, to study these laws, what needs to be amended. 2019, uh, 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 tax policy in the Ministry of Finance, Uganda Revenue Authority, Bank of Uganda, uh, uh, insurance regulatory authority, capital markets, uh, Uganda Bankers Association. Me, I joined that committee from the banking sector because I was still in the bank. But when I joined Microfinance Support Center, I still uh, prevailed at that committee as a member. Until it's, it's now like five years down the road when we have been studying these laws, what needs to be amended in the tax regime. We've amended uh, the Income Tax Act uh, the, uh, the, the value added tax uh, act and other relevant tax regime which we have amended but it has not just come now it has taken like five years with the serious studies with the serious engagement of stakeholders that committee has been working uh, in the Ministry of Finance until, uh, until these bills uh, were presented uh, was it on 20th on Tuesday mm -hmm. but uh, even some member of parliament who are interested they have been engaged in this matter. This is not the first time of its appearance. And some countries, I, uh, uh, I can tell you reliably that uh, some countries have chosen to do Islamic banking without amending even the tax, the tax regime, even having any law like, ta like uh, Kenya. If you look at Kenya, where it started from, Islamic banking is thriving in Kenya, but they don't have those amendments. Okay. It's thriving in South Africa. 
they didn't have those amendments. And by the way, that is the work of the parliament. If you don't understand it now, there is room to change that law. Even you can test it one day and you, and you amend it. That is the work of the parliament to amend the laws. So let us start. The market is really yearning for this uh, global trend, Islamic banking. Well, Islamic banking does touch something that is very crucial, to, and I guess it's the debate for the Ministry of Finance especially, because at the end of the day, we've got to support the economy, development and enhancements in all these uh, different uh, forms. Uh, let's talk about interest, Mr. Mayanja. It represents any fixed or guaranteed uh, payment on the cash advancements or deposits when you do have these customers borrowing from the banks, and then they're expected to pay over and above what they have borrowed, which comes back to the bank to be able to then be con to, uh, converted into uh, taxes given to the, uh, the economy and the circulation goes on and on. The fear is that this will actually curtail Uganda's growth economically. <laughs> so now just a little historical fact on, on interest rate. The first ideas on interest started with, uh, see when you're going to produce something you mainly need like the factors of production, like three things mainly the knowledge to do it, the labor, and the capital. So while labor, the compensation for labor normally is in terms of salaries and wages, the compensation for capital uh, in the traditional conventional system is interest. So the idea was that if you went to somebody and got a form of capital to work with, then you have to compensate the capital. The, the interest rate system uh, presumes a rate before you start the venture and you agree that you're going to pay 10%. And uh, regardless of the outcome of the enterprise, um, you're supposed to pay back that interest. The Islamic finance system is the opposite of that. Uh, th there is risk taking also from the financial institution for the same capital in that there is a predetermined interest share, okay, profit share not interest but profit share. So should the company turn out not to have the right outcomes, then you'd share that risk. So speaking of the economics right now, the, there is a little bit of depression in terms of uh, uh, the government's uh, room to borrow. And also that means that there's less expenditure and less growth. So the coming of Islamic finance at this time would actually increase the inflow of capital. And there are a number of companies that would benefit from it because right now their, their debt equity ratios uh, do not qualify them for conventional finance. Then also you have to remember that Uganda is a member of the OIC, which is a 43-member body. And our international trade sometimes is curtailed by the fact that we cannot issue instruments that they consider to be compliant with their systems. And that has kind of limited our international trade. So I see positives uh, from this amendment because then we are expecting approximately 300 to 400 million dollars worth of internal uh, FDI in the sector that would boost the already existing uh, uh, financial resources that we have. Then from the government side, um, I don't know whether you've heard of Suku bonds for example, Egypt recently, you know, had a bit of financial stress and they issued a Sukuk bond and they were able to generate the capital they needed for investment. So when you look at Uganda right now, we are almost hitting our debt ceiling and the Sukuk bond would offer the government an alternative form of long-term finance. So right now, actually, it's a very good time to have this, these amendments. You have mentioned risk, um, Dr. Ruja. Where is the risk management with Islamic banking? Uh, of course, uh, Islamic finance, uh, uh, all Islamic banks will be faced with uh, the ordinary risks in conversion or like operation or the normal risks they will face uh, equally, the Islamic banking products. But there are some unique risks for Islamic banking which government has tried uh, to, uh, to address in these laws, in these amendments. That's why we need to pave the way to allow the industry to start. The most inherent risk in Islamic banking is the Sharia and compliance risk. Other risks are the same. Operational, uh, liquidity, they are the same and they can be addressed 
Bank of Uganda knows how it has been uh, supervising and regulating these risks for uh, requiring the banks to regulate them. Uh, but for Sharia, you can see in the amendments which were tabled, uh, there is uh, the establishment of the Sharia advisory board in every bank. Every financial institution which conducts Islamic banking business shall have to appoint and maintain a Sharia advisory board. Every bank is going to appoint a Sharia advisory board. And the work of the Sharia advisory board will be to ensure what he has talked about compliance with the Sharia requirements. It will be the work of this board to ensure that a financial institution really complies with Sharia uh, principles. Mm -hmm. So they are addressed in the laws. We are here about tax, tax, tax. We don't need now to practice Islamic banking, by the way, really, we don't need these amendments. We are very late. We would have, we would have started operating a long time ago. Bank of Uganda just needs uh, the amendment of that Financial Institutions Act to allow the banks have the Sharia Advisory Board to start, such, such that they can mitigate that risk of Sharia non-compliance. Mr. Mayanja, uh, who does it benefit for the government to hold this long, uh, these amendments? and uh, implementation. Uh, I'm sorry? Oh. Who is it benefiting for the government to hold off uh, these amendments uh, that he has spoken about in terms of the banking sector? Actually, what, what the government is trying to do now, if I may give you a historical fact, uh, when the Financial Institution Act was amended, it required what was called a Central Sharia Advisory Board at the Central Bank. Okay. That would have required the Central Bank to amend the Banking Act that created uh, the central bank. Now, you have to understand that this business is practiced in Muslim majority countries and Muslim minority countries. So Uganda happens to be a Muslim minority country in the sense that there was no need to have within the structures of the central bank uh, a central Sharia board. If you go to countries like Malaysia, you will find it there. It's ni over 90% Muslim. When you go to United Kingdom, they don't have it. So what the government is trying to do is to walk back that and say, okay, we can take the advisory board to the institution that actually wants to do it. And so that's why we are having this amendment. Actually, I don't see any benefit from, from delaying because right now, like I've told you, you know, you've been having a lot of conversations around this, around the budget. You had the debt sustainability assessment the other day that right now, when you are in a bit of a mix, the country needs new injections of capital to grow. And this would be one avenue that would create a new inflow of capital. Our estimates are, you know, over 300 million. So because every institution will need approximately 30 to 40 million. So if five of them take it up, you're having a, a higher inflow of FDI, which would increase the probability of a business getting money. So you have to understand that uh, the probability of an SME getting money depends on the available resources. It's called the loanable theory model of finance. So basically, the amount of money that you have available for lending would impact the probability and would impact the cost. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you bring in new alternative forms of finance in the economy, you're going to increase the probability of an SME getting money, and you're also going to impact the cost. So I see positives only. I, I really don't see any benefit in delaying. Now, just to explain the tax issue a little bit, um, unlike conventional institutions, Islamic financial institutions tend to lend you uh, exactly what you need. So if, if you are somebody who sells, let's say, bottles of water, the Islamic financial institution is required to actually acquire those bottles of water, then lend them to you, as opposed to giving you money to mm. buy. Mm. And so there would have been an element of double taxation, because then they have to buy the goods, then they give them to you, and so they are buying and selling. Yeah. It's more like a merchant bank arrangement. And there was a need then to streamline that and make it very clear within the laws how that will operate. And then they w you would then have to pay stamp duty twice. So for example, if it's a mortgage and they have to give you a house, they would actually have to buy the house and then they would have to sell you the house. That's how it works in practice. So okay. that means you'd have to pay stamp duty twice.
I don't know if that makes sense. For um, uh, you have raised more eyebrows, I will say. But you <laughs> talked about uh, injections of capital growth. Uh, which government has um, many of them that have come up uh, post-COVID-19 to really reboost the economy as we speak? So when you look at the investment enhancing initiatives and programs that have been put by government, uh, wouldn't this be a conflict uh, for them, uh, people, Uganda is not utilizing what government has offered because there's now an alternative in Islamic banking that allows them uh, better benefits and yet gives them leniency in regards to recovery. Now, actually, no. What, what I said at the beginning is that you broaden the system to create. It's like when you go to the restaurant, you have a menu. <laughs> it has meat, it has beans. So the financial system is designed to have different products for different types of institutions and different types of businesses. So the more the merrier. In this case, you know, there is no direct competition because be between what the government is doing with Emioga, with what he's doing with, uh, for example, Dr. Luja is working at the Microfinance Support Center. They have been uh, rolling out finance for SMEs. But you have to understand that there are also some big corporations that require large amounts of capital that that msc for example or emioga cannot afford cannot them okay. because they are dealing in, in in micro micro and yet the the big corporate and investment banks um, sometimes will take loans of up to 10 million or even 15 million dollars in which case the depth of the islamic development bank and its group of companies would be more suited so if somebody wants to build a dam 100, 100 megawatts, you're talking 120 to 150 million dollars. That's more than the total capital of microfinance support center. So there's no direct uh, competition. It's, it's more like alternative forms of finance which would suit the different borrowers. Yeah, okay. so the more the merrier. Dr. Luja, you have interacted with society when they are picking up loans for the different initiatives that are, especially under yeah, microfinance, those quite are numerous. Um, in regards to the options that are always availed on the table, what's the consumption consideration of that which is being availed through government versus that which is being availed directly? And also in light of Islamic banking coming into enactment. Uh, uh, thank you. At microfinance support center, we have already tested it. We are already doing it, but at small scale, as it has said. We have financed to the tune uh, of uh, over 85 billion Uganda shillings. And by the way, for uh, bigger tickets, as it has said, the corporate ones, is Islamic Development Bank has just established in Uganda, has come. It is our development partner. We are member country of uh, Organization of Islamic Corporation, OIC. They have set up an office here in Kampala, a regional hub for, among all the five countries, it chose Uganda. And it was already some discussion back. Uh, it had a discussion of setting up a big uh, uh, wholesale bank here, partnering with government mm -hmm. and bringing in money. The, the question is, the problem is not money to Islamic Development Bank. The problem is not money to OIC member countries, but where to put it. Do you have the enabling legal framework, mm. the enabling legal environment, mm. such as that uh, their financing, their money will be Sharia compliant? That is the question. Now, to microfinance support center, what we are doing, we are already, do because we are not regulated by Central Bank, Bank of Uganda, we are already doing it because we are self regulated. Uh, we are regulated by our board. We have a board which, was, uh, which is established by government. So we can uh, already. Uh, finance, small projects, circles, cooperatives, village saving and loan association, and some SMEs. By the way, some SMEs, they are not small tickets. We, we have given, we are, we are financing from five million, that is to the lower end, lower tail down there. Then the bigger one, the, 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 the maximum limit is three billion. Three billion is for big SMEs. Mm -hmm. But let us open up. So may I feel that uh, at this time the discussion should be opening up for uh, uh, foreign direct investments to come in. IDB is already here. Many investors have submitted their applications. Uh, in 2017, the third largest Islamic bank in the world, that is Al Baraka Banking Group, it came here, the president of that bank came here. He visited the Bank of Uganda, the late Mutevide. He visited him. He visited the Minister of Finance. He wanted to see the President. 
They wanted to bring in financing. That is the third largest. When it went to South Africa, they turned around the economy of South Africa. That is Al-Baraka. We had a chance of starting in 2017, but because of the delay, because of the too much laws, because of the too much uh, benchmarking, the too much uh, stakeholder engagement, what, what, they went away because they cannot deal with such unserious people. So let us not lose uh, the chance which has come to us. Islamic Development Bank has come. They are ready to set up under the ICD Islamic Corporation uh, for the development of the private sector. They have that wing. They can set up and provide big ticket Islamic financing. Therefore begs the question, do we need one law for Islamic banking? I had that discussion in the committee and one stakeholder mentioned it that we need one law. You cannot have uh, different laws amending differently. The approach government of Uganda has taken is uh, to equalize the treatment of Islamic and conventional. As my colleague has said, mm -hmm. we are not an Islamic state. We are not a Muslim majority country where we can have laws addressing only Islamic for Muslims. Yeah, because then the rest of you know the denominations also rise to make a case for themselves. Th that is, uh, for example, like, uh, like uh, the approach taken by Malaysia, as he has said, the approach taken by Saudi Arabia, that one can be understood, well understood in those jurisdictions. But in Uganda, given that uh, Muslims are just minority, and uh, this is a question of just uh, playing around with the sen sentiments of people and misperceptions of people, that's why government took the approach of uh, just providing a level playing field, treating Islamic banking like conventional banking, just equalizing the treatment, but not having a special treatment for Islamic banking. That one which was proposed by, uh, by, uh, by, uh, by, uh, by our colleague in, uh, in the session of committee yesterday cannot be applicable in Uganda. We have already decided as Uganda to just treat Islamic banking the way we are treating conventional banking, mm. not to offer special treatment for Islamic. Because when you provide a special law, having all the Islamic laws inside there, you will be like uh, intending to favor or disfavor Islamic which government does not want. It wants to equalize the treatment, and it wants, as its role, major role is to provide a level playing field for both Islamic and conventional. So the approach we have already decided to take is just equalize the treatment, treat Islamic the same way conventional is treated. Uh, precisely, if you look at the laws, by the way, all the tax laws which we are presented to the parliament, I don't know why it is taking too much time. Uh, you, you look at the object, at the introduction, memorandum. The object of this bill, every bill, this is the first uh, introductory, introductory statement. The object of this bill is to amend the Income Tax Act, for example, CAP uh, 340, to provide for equal tax treatment. Mm -hmm. Our intention is to provide for equal tax treatment of Islamic financial business and it for business to conversion of financial services or Islamic business. That is the intention. We want to equalize the treatment. We don't want to provide a special treatment for either Islamic or conversion. Okay. Therefore, Mr. Mayanja, um, how visible is it to successfully implement the Islamic banking with the very likelihood that the amendments into the six laws uh, could actually uh, be passed or not passed later on in the Finance Committee sitting this afternoon? It's very highly likely because we have, like Doctor has told you, you know, we, we started advocating for this in around 2014. And by the time some of us started, you know, maybe our parents before us <laughs> had started 10 years before that. So right now I see that it is, we are more ready. And the reason I say that I'm looking at the factors of production. So for example, Dr. Luja was teaching, in around 2016 I was very, you know, active in right. trying to advocate for this. And at that time our worry was human resource, right. people who know how to do this. But since that time, uh, in six years, uh, the Islamic universities in, in Uganda has graduated a number of uh, students who can take it up. Then secondly, uh, the banks that we have here that are licensed like KCB, uh, ABSA Bank, Standard Chartered Bank, they already operate Islamic finance in, in other countries like Malaysia and Kenya which means that they already have the systems. Then to our advantage there is a very supportive uh, partner 
who is very well capitalized in the Islamic Development Bank that has invested a lot of money in getting us to this point. Then there are some specialized banks that have come in, like Salam African Bank, I think, took over top finance, and they are ready. They, it's not that they are a startup. They've been doing this in, in Djibouti for a very long time. So I am very confident that uh, we have the manpower and the capital and now the enabling framework for Islamic finance to, to start in Uganda. Okay. Right. Um, uh, Dr. Luja, we do have the locally generated uh, banks here, such as Centenary Bank. You do have the regional banks, such as Equity. So when it comes to implementation, uh, is this limited to banks that are um, Muslim lenient, or is it adoptable by any other banks uh, for that matter? Uh, thank you very much for that question. Even I had in the committee some members who were proposing such delays, unnecessary delays, more delays, saying that an Islamic bank is coming. There is nothing like an Islamic bank which is coming, a special Islamic bank. This is just a window. The amendments which came in the Financial Institutions Act to bring Islamic banking was to enable the existing conversion of banking system, banks we have in Uganda, to have a window for Islamic banking. You know a window. Just like you have seen agent banking. Mm -hmm. By the way, these amendments came together in 2015, in those bills which amended the Financial Institutions Act 2004. Agent banking was adopted by every bank in Uganda. Bank assurance was adopted by every bank. The same to Islamic banking. Every bank in Uganda is going to do it. By the way, they are just keeping quiet, as I told you. KCB, let me mention, sorry to mention their names, because they are, well, they are ready, they are going to do it. Mm. And uh, the world is global. You can see what is happening in Kenya. They are doing Islamic banking. They know what to do. Standard Chartered. I was in Malaysia. I studied in Malaysia. I saw Standard Chartered Swadek. For them, they know what to do. They are going to do it. It's a question of just amending, having the second reading today and the third reading, have the Bank of Uganda issue, start issuing a license. You will see Standard Chartered flying in their scholars to come here in Uganda. Mm -hmm. They are experts from Malaysia. They have Standard Chartered Swadek. Uh, 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 you have Barclays, ABSA, they are doing it in South Africa. Stand, Stambik, they are already doing it. Tropical Bank, they are already, they know what to do. They are doing it uh, in, uh, in, in Libya. Okay. So it is uh, a, a w a, an operation. It is like a product, a new product, which is going to be done by even Centenary Bank. Let me tell you, Centenary Bank has more Muslim customers than the indigenous Muslim uh, affiliated banks, you know, in Uganda here. Don't you know it? Mm -hmm. They have more. They cannot afford to lose this no client. Clientele. They cannot. So what they have to do, and I know it because I was in the banking sector for five years, even uh, in Uganda Bankers Association. They are ready. Centenary Bank is ready. Therefore, when we come to the consumer end of this conversation, it's still an open consumer product to anybody, not limited to the Muslim community. Of course, of course. And let me tell you, let me assure you, I am managing uh, the Islamic investments at Microfinance Support Center. This is a government agency. Ex it is extending affordable financing from government, government programs. But let me tell you that over 95% of my clients in the portfolio of Islamic are non-Muslims. Let me repeat. <laughs> over 95% of consumers of Islamic products I am the manager of Islamic investment, that for portfolio. They are non-Muslims. Go to the big circles in Uganda you have. Wazalendo, go to the, are they Muslims? Mm -hmm. Go to the big circles, Chamuhunga, in the west. Everywhere, because in, in the central here, the idea of cooperative and circles has not, has, has not been understood, well understood in the central here in Kampala. But uh, in up country, in the west, in the east, these are understood. And the big circles you have there, they have taken this money and they know what to do. And what is surprising, even in the parliament, mm. those members of parliament, they are consuming my products, mm. Islamic. Mm. They are taking Islamic, they know what it means. Why don't you allow even uh, the poor person at, at the end down there? Because most of our clients in Kampala here, most of our clients are in the central here. They cannot be eligible for my products, Islamic products, because you have my products are limited in a way that you have to be in a circle 
kind of setting. You have to have been in existence for more than two years. And you don't find such in okay. Kampala here. Mr. Mayanda, uh, today's Daily Monitor has URA raises red flag on digital couplets. Uh, in other words, in terms of uh, readiness and preparation of implementation, uh, there's still some loopholes in there that need to be addressed. In the same regard regarding Islamic banking, where the loopholes in terms of readiness, preparation, uh, perception, uh, education of the public that would be ending up consuming uh, these services, where do the institutions, where do they need to actually tighten up to get themselves ready for the adoption of Islamic banking? King. The biggest risk uh, to Islamic finance in Uganda has been the subject you are just discussing with Dr. Lujia. Because uh, people tend to equate it to religion, and yet it is a business. So sometimes the sentiments uh, when you're dealing with this topic can be, um, I've been on that end of, of, of that. Uh, people can attack you because they are looking at it, this business from a religious lens yeah so that is the biggest risk uh, for it and um, even up to now the delay in the implementation has I think somewhat come from there that's the biggest risk it faces then secondly um, there is the something technically they call it moral hazard like you borrow money for something else and then you do something else so because Islamic finance takes takes risks with the, with the borrower in this market, they, that's going to be, um, you know, a big challenge for the banks to enforce. Usually, in some countries, it, the Islamic finance uh, institutions will appoint a board member in a company where they have put money to mitigate that risk, or sometimes take more, uh, you know, control. Uh, that that is likely to be a challenge. Then the other, the third challenge is going to be the general prevailing uh, macroeconomic conditions. But the biggest one is going to be liquidity risk. So these banks, um, when they feel that things are not going so well and they need liquidity, they have liquidity windows within the central bank that are set up for them. And that's why the banking system has been uh, relatively stable. So when, when, let's say, Centenary Bank feels a bit stretched in terms of you needing your cash, <laughs> they have a window at the central bank where they can go and deposit something and then at the bank rate they can get the liquidity they need to give you your cash and these kinds of instruments uh, that can enable the islamic financial institutions to do that have not yet been set up so those are the four things that i see as the main risks which we need to you know to look at okay yeah. so in regards to moving forward uh, past what is going to happen in the you know committee sitting this afternoon um, how best should these institutions ready themselves because we've seen institutions like tropical bank um, uh, underlyingly there it used to give these options but we see it also taking a step back in this regard so how do we have these financial institutions um, positively adopt and make it open the, the key thing for them to adopt is a, a, a system, a core system, because the way you calculate your benefits in an Islamic finance is different from the way you calculate interest. That's so the yeah. first thing really is the bank operating system. That's, that's the key, the core, uh, basically, that will tell you precisely how much money you're supposed to get. Then human resources. Uh, at, at some point, you know, like we told you, some banks have an advantage that they have, but it doesn't mean that those human resources are easily extendable to, to Uganda. So there has to be a lot of training, a lot of training, both at the government level and at the, because, you know, government owns some banks and they're going to take it up. You see, they own Housing Finance Bank, Pride Microfinance, Post Bank. Uh, so there's got to be a lot of training, human resource then the other element uh, for, for them to get ready is to raise capital. Because, you know, because of the liquidity challenges related to Islamic finance, they're going to need a lot more capital yeah. than they have. Those are the key three areas that, that, that they need to be looking at. Okay, which three key areas, Dr. Luja, all require investment <laughs> by the banks <laughs> and financial institutions in the first place. But uh, nevertheless, this has succeeded in so many other regions. Tell us about the success of it and how that has, you know, overturned economies around. Uh, as he said, by the way, Islamic banking started some 
somewhat had earlier than that, started in, 20, uh, in 1965, but, but not with the actual banks. Of course, it, su it has succeeded in Malaysia, where it started uh, from. Uh, they started with uh, Tabunga Hajj. Uh, then it went to Saudi Arabia. Until 90s, when uh, the European countries started adopting the idea. Because at first they thought maybe it is, it's about Islam. It's about Islamizing the state. Like some fears which are here in Uganda. Some people still think that it's, it's a question of Islamizing, promoting Sharia. But when Europe... Uh, learned that it's about just development we saw countries like uk united kingdom adopting it united kingdom just not adopting it just not doing it for the sake of doing mm -hmm. today united kingdom is striving to become the global gateway for islamic finance even in terms of teaching it is competing with malaysia okay. in malaysia which is a muslim country islamic state it's competing with them it is the best in teaching if you want the best degree, they are, they are, they, they, they are in rivals, Durham, Durham University and universities in Malaysia. They are competing. Even you can, you can see in their universities, Birmingham Universities, uh, uh, London School of Economics, you, you can see professors teaching Sharia, supervising uh, PhDs, supervising mm -hmm. master's thesis, big thesis in Sharia. Peter, John, their professors, they are not Muslims. So it has succeeded in United Kingdom. It has succeeded in Australia. It has succeeded in Canada. It has succeeded in Luxembourg. It has succeeded uh, uh, in Bosnia. Even in Russia, you have seen Putin. He has not just we adopted it. African countries. African country. I was <laughs> coming to, to the Africa. Continent, doctor. Yes, I was coming to the continent. Uh -huh. I had, I, I no, had no, to no, first no. finish The there. continent is closer to us. Yes. Mm -hmm. South Africa, mm. it has succeeded there. I talked of uh, Al-Baraka Bank there. It has succeeded in South Africa. It has succeeded in Kenya. Now I've come to the border here. Mm. <laughs> in Kenya, it has done well. <laughs> and and uh, you can see the economy of Kenya. Yes. By the way, it started it, it in 20, 2006. Mm. That's why Barclays Bank there, it started it. Okay. Now it has moved. In 2006, it was Barclays. Barclays, a UK bank, which started Islamic banking okay. in Kenya. All right. So then there's hope for us in Uganda. Thank you so much, Dr. Suleiman Lujra. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayanja Abubeka, for enlightening us on Islamic banking. I trust that they have opened your eyes a little bit better in understanding what it is about and who's eligible for it. It's for all Ugandans. It's really an alternative financing uh, tool that can be adopted in the financial institutions of Uganda. Later on this afternoon, the likelihood of uh, amendments into the six laws that are being revised uh, for the purposes of, of conformity shall be passed hopefully uh, with the finance committee sitting in parliament we wait to have uh, news in what will come out of the aftermath so look out for that later on in the bulletins here on ntv we do take a short breather return